pleasure for us to receive Raul Oset Sinha. Uh, he's going to speak about curvatures of singular surfaces. <clears throat> well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Marcelo for the invitation. And uh, especially because this is, this is the first time I'm in IMPA. And uh, yeah, yeah. And I heard, I wasn't here, but I heard that Marcelo said that you aren't a mathematician until you've been in IMPA. So that means today I've become a mathematician or something like that. Anyways, um, the invitation. Okay, so <clears throat> I was, as I was saying, the um, uh, invitation I received said that, well, first the name of the conference is a panorama on singularities. And the invitation said that we had to give talks uh, showing the state of the art of the, of the topic. So uh, then what I decided is my talk is going to be, the first half is going to be a survey on what has been done up to now on curvatures of singular surfaces. And the second half of my talk will be a new type of curvature, which I've defined in a recent paper with uh, Kentaro Saji. Okay. So <clears throat> the talk, first uh, I will talk about frontals first, because there's a very important type of uh, singular surfaces. And I will give some definitions of curvatures for frontals and some results related to these curvatures, and then some more curvatures. I mean, there are loads of curvatures in this talk, obviously. <laughs> and then I will talk about a more general setting, which is uh, any core rank one singularity, and some curvatures that have been defined in uh, this uh, broader, uh, broader uh, class. Uh, in particular, the Second curvature, this axial curvature, is the, my joint work with uh, Kentaro Sati. Okay, so first of all, uh, why are frontals important? I will define what a frontal is in a moment. But why are frontals important? For, because they appear naturally, naturally in many different contexts. For example, as parallel surfaces of immersed surfaces in R3, you can get singularities, and these singularities are of frontal type. Also in developable surfaces, for example, the tangent developable of a space curve. In contact geometry, uh, wave fronts appear in physics in different uh, areas, such as optics or cosmology. And uh, even in dynamical systems, you also get singularities which are frontals. So they appear very naturally, and it's very natural to want to understand these singularities from the differential geometry point of view. I want to point out these two papers because they can be considered more or less the beginning of, this, uh, of the study of the differential geometry of uh, singular surfaces. I mean, obviously, singular surfaces have been around for over 150 years or even more, probably. But uh, to study the differential geometry, or classical differential geometry, if you want, of uh, singular surfaces is more recent. And uh, these two papers could be amongst the first, and in fact, I want to point out uh, <clears throat> this paper uh, has 94 citations. That was when I wrote the talk. I think today it's already at 98. And this one has uh, around 61 now or something. You know, for our area in singularity theory, uh, having that number of citations is very rare, very, very rare. And this means that these articles uh, are not, uh, have motivated not only people in singularity theory, they've motivated people in the differential geometry. Okay, so they are important in that sense. And they are the beginning of uh, more than 60 papers in differential geometry of singular surfaces in the past 10 years. 90% okay, so, uh, of which are about frontals. Okay. So out of those 60 papers, I'm going to extract uh, some uh, interesting results related to uh, curvatures, okay. which can be defined for singular surfaces. Okay, first of all, I'm going to define, obviously, what is a frontal. So basically, a frontal is just a map germ from R2 to R3, uh, such that it has a well-defined normal unit vector field. Okay? Even if it's singular, you can have a well-defined normal vector field. So, well, a normal vector field, obviously, this just means that the scalar product with the differential of any tangent uh, vector is zero. 
And uh, in particular, uh, a frontal can be a wavefront if the pair F, F with the normal is an immersion. Okay, uh, a legendary immersion if you want, because this is a legendary vibration, but well, it doesn't matter. So we have a, a wavefronts, which were the classical objects that have been studied, and a generalization of these wavefronts are the frontals, where you don't uh, ask for this to be an immersion. Examples, uh, for example, the cuspidal edge, uh, this over here, oops, sorry. The cuspidal edge, the swallowtail, and the cuspidal cross cap. These two first ones are wavefronts. This last one is not a wavefront, but it is a frontal, okay? So these are typical examples of frontal singularities. So some pre previous definitions. Uh, we consider the function, this is the determinant of the partial with respect to u, partial with respect to v, and the normal. This is called the uh, area density function. And uh, the singular set is the preimage of zero by this function. And we call a singular point non-degenerate if the differential of this lambda is different to zero. And uh, at a non-degenerate singular point, there is a well-defined uh, vector field such that the differential uh, of f applied to that vector field is zero. And this is what we call a null vector field. So a singular point is called of the first kind if this null vector field acting over lambda is not zero. And what happens is that if you have a singularity of the first kind, this uh, null vector field is transversal to the singular set. So in that case, we can consider another vector field which is tangent, such that that pair of vector fields uh, form a, a positive basis. And uh, if gamma is the parametrization of the singular curve, uh, then we call gamma hat the image of the singular curve. Okay, so with these uh, definitions, we can go on to define uh, certain curvatures for first kind uh, singularities. And these are the singular curvature, limiting normal curvature, cuspidal curvature, and cusp bidirectional torsion. And they are defined as follows. The singular curvature, uh, if you remind, if remember your classical differential geometry, this formula might remind you to the geodesic curvature. And why is this? Because this singular curvature is like a limit of the geodesic uh, curvature in the regular part to the singular curve. Okay. And the limiting normal curvature, as the name uh, tells you, is a uh, limiting normal curvature. Okay. <coughs> and then uh, using those pair of, uh, pairs of vector fields I uh, defined before, you can define also the cuspidal uh, curvature and the cusp directional torsion. Obviously, these formulas don't, won't tell you anything, so what is the geometrical interpretation of these curvatures? Well, the singular curvature uh, is the, basically the curvature of uh, this uh, cuspidal edge. Okay? The limiting normal here, when you have the cuspidal edge, the limiting normal the well-defined normal uh, direction is this one, okay? So this is obviously a curvature in that normal direction. Then you have the cusp directional torsion. Uh, you can see it indicates how <coughs> the surface is, uh, uh, the, how it's going, uh, the how it's getting torsion around the cuspidal edge. Mm -hmm. And the cuspidal curvature, which measures the openness of the cuspidal edge in a way, okay? So these are the geometrical interpretations. And why are these curvatures uh, interesting or important? Well, to start with, um, there's this theorem. If you consider the curvature of the cuspidal edge as a space curve, okay, the cuspidal edge is a space curve. So if you consider the curvature, then the square of this curvature is equal to the singular curvature squared plus the limiting normal curvature squared. Okay. This might remind you also of a similar result in the regular case uh, where you put here the geodesic curvature and here the normal curvature. Okay. So it generalizes the regular uh, case. And uh, more importantly, uh, if you have two uh, cuspidal edges and suppose that they have the same six invariants, this is the, the four curvatures are defined and the derivatives of two of them. So if you have, if they have the same curvatures at zero, these two cuspidal edges, then there's a diffeomorphism in the source 
and an isometry in the target, which takes one to the other up to order uh, four, up to order three, okay? This means that these curvatures determine uh, uniquely the a cuspidal edge up to order three, okay? So this is why these curvatures are important and significant. And, but that's not the only thing that you can do with these curvatures. There are some interesting facts, for example, uh, for cuspidal edges, this uh, singular curvature is an intrinsic invariant. <clears throat> this is very interesting because in the definition of the uh, uh, singular curvature, uh, we had the normal uh, appeared in the formula. However, it is an intrinsic invariant. <clears throat> and also, uh, if f is a frontal and p is a singular point of the first kind, then the uh, cuspidal curvature tells us whether it is a wavefront or not, okay? So it's also uh, a way of distinguishing frontals which are wavefronts or not. And then it gets more interesting here. Uh, for cuspidal edges, again, uh, Teramoto proved that there exist C infinity functions away from the singular set, okay? That's in the regular set called kappa plus and kappa minus, such that the Gaussian curvature is the product of these two functions the mean curvature is the sum of these two curvatures, uh, of these two functions, right? and such that if the caspial curvature is non-zero, then kappa plus is a bounded function on the singular point, and kappa minus is unbounded. And moreover, kappa plus is the normal curvature. What is this saying? This is saying that you can interpret the limiting normal curvature as a principal curvature for singular surfaces, okay? For, for cuspidal edges, sorry. Uh, and uh, this is very interesting because uh, Martin, Sadio, Mejar and Yamada, for singular points of the first kind, they defined a product curvature, which is the product of the cuspidal curvature times the normal curvature. And first of all, they proved that it is an intrinsic invariant. This, since we've just seen that kappa nu is a kind of principal curvature, this is a kind of theorema egregium for uh, sing, uh, singular surfaces with singularities of the first kind, okay? And this product curvature, in fact, it tells us more. Uh, it tells us that the Gaussian curvature is bounded if and only if this product curvature is zero in the singular set. You know, the, the Gaussian curvature can tend to infinity in the, singular, in the singular set, but it can also be bounded. And it is bounded in Oops, in this case, okay? So uh, these curvatures give uh, lots of information uh, about the geometry of the singular surfaces. And uh, in fact, the, with these curvatures, you can prove gauss bonnet for certain singular surfaces. How? First of all, uh, the Gaussian curvature, as I said, in the singular set can tend to infinity, but uh, if you consider this two form, which is the Gaussian curvature times the area density function, okay, uh, this is a two form, and this is uh, well defined over the singular set. It can be globally extended, uh, as a, a, a globally defined two form on the whole surface, okay, even in the singular set. Okay? So then, uh, then we can prove uh, some gauss bonnet type theorem. So if you have a compact oriented to manifold in a Riemannian three manifold oriented also, uh, which is a front, there is this theorem, which is a kind of Gauss bonnet. But as you see here, we have the integral of the uh, of this. It's not here. You see, this is Gaussian curvature d a prime, and here there is no prime. This is not a mistake. The difference between this one and this one is just that basically. So when you have your singular set, if this is the singular set, then, and this is m, you can divide m into m plus and m minus, where here the co-orientation or, and the orientation of the surface is a positive basis of R3, and here uh, it's not, okay? So you can divide that, and this kappa dA is just uh, kappa dA prime in M plus and kappa minus kappa dA prime in M minus, 
OK? So, well, the integral of this well-defined two form uh, is equal to the 2 pi times the Euler characteristic of the surface, but there is a term which doesn't appear in the uh, classical gauss bonnet theorem, and this term is the integral over the singular set of the singular curvature. Okay, so you can recover gauss bonnet but with some uh, new stuff. By the way, I didn't say uh, this is so. This was proved for fronts which admit most peak singularities. Uh, peak singularity is just a singularity <coughs> that has like uh, many cuspidal edges going towards it. So it can be like a birth of for swallowtails or something like that. Um, this has been proved uh, for more general cases uh, in later uh, in other papers, but well, this was the first the first one. And also there's this other uh, formula, gauss bonnet type, which is here uh, we do have this well-defined two form. This is the sum of the interior angles in M plus at the peak, and this is the sum of the interior angles of the M minus region at the peak. And here you have the Euler characteristic of M plus minus the Euler characteristic of M minus. Well, so this is Gauss Bonnet for, for some frontal type singularities. And there are other theorems where these curvatures appear. For example, in Coendring type theorems. Uh, what is Coendring theorem? See, so if you have a regular surface and you project it to a plane, an orthogonal projection, Coendring proved that the Gaussian curvature of the surface can be obtained as the product of these two curvatures. One is the curvature of the normal section with the, let me draw this. So you have a regular surface and you project it to a plane and the projection, you get something like this. So the Gaussian curvature of this surface is equal to the curvature of this curve, which is the apparent contour, the image of the projection, times the curvature of the normal section with this plane, okay? using the kernel of this projection. This is what uh, Kendrick proved. Well, this is an interesting theorem for many geometrical reasons. For example, it tells you that uh, if you have an inflection point in the projection, this can only happen if you have a parabolic point in the surface, things like this. Uh, but anyways, uh, is there a version of this for singular surfaces? So Kentaro Sati, uh, he proved a singular version of this theorem. Uh, so you have the gamma hat is the image of the singular curve uh, of the Caspian edge, basically. And you consider the, this is the well-defined normal. This is the derivative of the curve. And you consider the cross product. And consider a direction which lies in the plane uh, defined by the normal and this psi. So if you have <coughs> a caspial edge, uh, this is the well-defined normal, this is gamma hat prime, and this is this psi. <coughs> Uh, so uh, you consider the orthogonal projection and to the plane orthogonal to this direction, and then you get this, uh, the Gaussian curvature, remember, can be 10 to infinity, but again, this is a well-defined two form on the whole surface. So you have this version of the Kendrick type formula, where kappa one, again, is the, is the curvature of the projection, kappa two is the curvature of the normal section, which can be singular, obviously. And uh, again, the singular curvature appears here. Okay? So this singular curvature is really, really important. OK, and uh, other things that you can do with these curvatures. Uh, these curvatures also capture the flat geometry of these singular surfaces. In what sense? The contact with flat objects, such as contact with planes or contact with spheres. Oh, no, so, sorry, <laughs> <We're not laughs> spheres are not flat objects. Uh, it captures, besides the flat uh, geometry, also the round geometry. But uh, here I'm going to say only about uh, contact with planes. Okay? Uh, for example, well, the torsion of the Caspian edge can be computed using these uh, curvatures. And uh, in a paper 
with my collaborator Farid Tari, uh, we proved that if you have a cuspidal edge surface, generically, uh, the only types of contacts with planes that you can have are either, well, obviously, if the plane is transverse, that uh, is not, the height function is not singular in this case, or if the plane contains the tangent direction but is not uh, to, the singular, to the singular curve, but it's not the tangent cone, uh, then uh, you can have only one of these three singularities. Uh, the, the contact is of one of these three types, uh, and it, they are characterized by this. Uh, if the plane is not the osculating plane of the singular curve, of the Caspian edge, or the plane is the osculating plane, but the torsion is different to zero. Here again, the curvatures are appearing. Or it is the, uh, an I3 singularity if the uh, plane is the osculating plane, the torsion is zero, but the derivative of the torsion is not zero. And uh, another generical situation is uh, that the plane coincides with the tangent cone, but is not the osculating plane to the curve, which is captured again by a curvature. And in this case, the height function has an I3 singularity. And uh, finally, the plane can be the tangent cone and coincides with the osculating plane, but the torsion is non-zero. And here, the height function has a D4 singularity. Okay. So again, uh, the curvatures appear in, in this, the study of flat geometry. Obviously, uh, you must have noticed that most of the situations I was talking about were cuspidal edges, uh, but uh, there are other kinds of frontal singularities. And in fact, the thing is that uh, for each kind of singularity, you can define new curvatures. Maybe curvatures that can only be defined for that uh, singularity, or that singularity and simpler singularities, something like that. So for example, if you consider the cuspidal crosscap, which was that other singularity I showed at the beginning, uh, just, well, just notice that if you take a section through the origin, well, here there's the picture. If you take a, sec a section through the origin, what you obtain is a rhomboid cusp, okay? So this means that uh, when you consider geometric invariants uh, and curvatures for this singularity, you have to uh, consider up to higher order. Uh, remember the, for cuspidal edges, the curvatures that I defined, uh, determine the cuspidal edge up to order three, okay? To study this uh, singularity, we have to consider if we want to get good information about the geometry, up to order five. So, well, if uh, the null vector field satisfies uh, these equations, not important, uh, Honda and Saji defined two other real numbers. This one is called the bias, and this one is called the secondary cuspidal curvature. And these are curvatures associated to rhomboid cusps. Okay? Uh, the bias measures how the rhomboid cusp, uh, how it goes away from this canonical, non-generic uh, shape, in a way, okay? So with a very high bias, you can see the Rumford cusp goes all on one side, on one semi-plane only, not, not like this one. And the secondary cuspidal curvature is a cuspidal curvature which measures the openness, but of a, a Rumford cusp in this case. Uh, another curvature which can be defined, so if you have a singular space curve, you can still define the torsion. It's just taking one derivative higher in the usual torsion, basically. So, well, with all these invariants and uh, the ones we had before, uh, myself and Kentaro Saji, we proved uh, in a previous paper um, that if you have two cuspidal crosscaps, well, there are some details here in the way we obtain these cuspidal crosscaps, but basically, uh, if these 16 invariants are equal, you have these ones, which are related to the curvatures I defined at the beginning, these two, which are uh, related to the rhomboid cusp, and this one, which is the singular torsion of a certain curve in the cuspidal. Well, there are some details, but the important uh, idea is that these 16 uh, curvatures determine the cuspidal cross cap up to order five. Okay, so, and uh, as I said, you can, uh, you now want to study a different kind of singularity, you can probably define certain new curvatures for that particular singularity and prove this type of results or things like that. 
Okay, so uh, now let's take a break. This has nothing to do with the talk. It's just a picture, but it's a singularity I discovered some time ago, and I thought it was very nice, and I called it the Fugu or Blowfish Singularity because it kind of kind of looks like a Fugu singularity, a Fugu fish. Uh, that is the the one that if you eat you can die because it's very venomous. Anyways, here you have a cuspidal crosscap. Here you have two regular crosscaps, and here you have a triple point that is uh, crossed by a cuspidal edge. Well, anyways, it has just to rest a little bit from all the mathematics. We can enjoy this picture. And uh, with this, I finish with frontals. Okay, and I'm going to talk about now a broader setting, which is any Corang 1 singularity. Okay, for example, the, the cross cap. The cross cap is a Corang 1 singularity, which is not a frontal. Okay, and it's also very interesting and has also been studied a lot. So, well, the setting is the following. Uh, a Corang 1 singular surface will be seen as the image of a Corang 1 map from a regular surface to R3, okay? And this regular surface has a local uh, uh, parametrization, which uh, I denote by phi. So the map F, which parametrizes the singular surface, I'm considering as the composition of the inverse of the local parametrization with the map G, okay? So F goes from here to here. And in this way, I can define a first fundamental form and a second fundamental form, uh, how? The first fundamental form, instead of defining it over the product of tangent spaces of my singular surface M, I define it over the tangent spaces of the regular surface, okay? And, what I, and how do I define it? The first fundamental form of XY is just the differential of G acting on X times the differential of G acting over Y. Obviously, this is, since G is current one, this is not a metric. This does not give a metric, it gives a pseudo metric. But uh, it's a first fundamental form, it has its coefficients and so on. And uh, the second fundamental form, again, we use the tangent space to the regular surface and uh, we define it over the basis as the projection to the normal space of the second order derivatives and we extend it uh, as a, uniquely as a symmetric, symmetric bilinear map to the whole space. So we have our first fundamental form, second fundamental form, and uh, we can define the following. This was defined by Martins and Nuño Ballesteros. So you consider the unitary tangent vectors and uh, you consider the map that goes from the unitary tangent vectors to the normal space given by the second fundamental form of XX, okay? And this image is what we call the curvature parabola. Okay? And we denote it by delta sub P. And, uh, <coughs> and uh, basically it's this. It's the image of all the unitary vectors. Okay, the image by the second fundamental form of the unitary vectors. But notice one thing. Um, I said that the first fundamental form is not a metric. It's a pseudo metric. So the unitary tangent vectors in the tangent space to, um, to the regular surface is not S1 as would usually be with a metric. The, the unitary tangent vectors are these ones over here. So it's two parallel lines in the tangent space. Here you have the construction. G goes from um, the regular to the singular. Here you have the local parametrization and this is F. So you have the cross cap singularity, for example, and the normal space, and uh, this is the curvature parabola. By the way, I stole this picture from Juanjo's paper. <laughs> I hope <laughs> you don't mind. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> okay, so in that paper they proved, amongst many other things, that the curvature parabola is degenerate if and only if P is not a cross cap point. Okay, so when it is a cross cap, you have a proper parabola, but when you have another singularity which is not a cross cap, it can degenerate. The parabola can degenerate to a half line, for example. Okay. And then def they defined a curvature. Uh, they defined the following curvature. In the case that uh, the curvature parabola is degenerate, okay, so it's not a proper parabola, it's, a, for example, a semi-line, a half line. Uh, well, you consider an adapted frame, don't worry about these details, I'll define it later. 
uh, but they define the, the umbilic curvature like this. So if you have, uh, this is the curvature parabola, the generate, it is a half line, which begins here, okay? And uh, if you have an adapted frame, two. So what uh, the definition is the projection to this direction, which is this value over here. This is the umbilic curvature. Okay. And uh, obviously, the, this definition does not depend on x because uh, here you have uh, the image of different vectors, but all, uh, uh, the projection is always the same. Okay, so this is well defined. Uh, well, here you have another picture. Uh, don't worry about these notations of the adapted frame, but basically, uh, as I said, the curvature, the umbilic curvature is this distance over here, and in the case that the curvature parabola is a point, it is the distance to the origin. Okay, that is the umbilic curvature. Why is this curvature interesting? Well, in that paper, they proved several things. First, that the height function in the direction of uh, V in a direction V has a singularity of Corang 2 if and only if the, height, the, the curvature parabola is degenerate, the umbilic curvature is zero, and V is an infinite binomial direction, which I'm not going to define, but, uh, okay. So it is uh, strongly related to flat geometry, this umbilic curvature, and uh, also to round geometry. The distance squared function uh, in a point U uh, has a singularity of Corang 2, again, if and only if the curvature parabola is degenerate, the umbilic curvature is non-zero, and u is this point, the origin plus uh, one over this curvature in the direction uh, nu 2, okay? So uh, it's an important curvature to study the geometry of singular objects. And more interestingly also, it turns out that this curvature is a generalization of one of the curvatures we saw before. And that is, uh, well, first, if consider a cuspidal edge and the well-defined unit normal vector field, uh, first of all, this well-defined normal is orthogonal to the line that contains uh, the curvature parabola, okay? So, so this would be the well-defined normal of the cuspidal edge. And uh, the umbilic curvature is the absolute value of the normal curvature. The normal, limiting normal curvature I defined for frontals, uh, this umbilic curvature is a generalization of that curvature for any Corank 1 singularity, okay? So this is uh, very, very strong. Well, the theorem continues. There are another two objects which I'll skip, but uh, what does this mean? Remember that I said uh, because by a theorem of Teramoto and also by other Japanese guys, uh, the normal curvature was a kind of principal curvature for singular, uh, for frontal surfaces, okay? And this is a generalization for any Corang 1 singularity, which means that the umbilic curvature is a principal curve, can be seen as a principal curvature for Corang 1 singular points, okay? This is also very strong. Uh, well, just uh, some propaganda. <laughs> uh, this is a result, not in surfaces in R3. I, uh, the talk is about singular surfaces in R3, but uh, I decided to put this uh, singular surfaces in R4. This was the thesis of uh, my former student, uh, co-supervised with Sidinha, Pedro Benedini. And uh, in his thesis, uh, he defined um, a umbilic curvature for surfaces in R4. So for singular surfaces in R4, the normal space is not a plane, it's uh, three-dimensional, so the curvature parabola is still a parabola, but it can be in a plane that does not go through the origin. So if the plane goes through the origin, it's defined as uh, Martin San Nuño Ballesteros defined it. If uh, the curvature parabola is in a plane that, is not, uh, that does not go through the origin, it is the distance from the origin to this plane. Okay, so it's a generalization of this curvature. Anyways, up to here, survey talk. Now, uh, let's start with the new stuff. Let me take a sip. Okay. 
So uh, the axial curvature, this is the new topic. It's a new kind of curvature which we have defined for any uh, singular Corang one, uh, for any Corang one singularity, okay? So first I have to define the adapted frame. Uh, when, the, when the curvature parabola is non-degenerate, uh, when it's a proper parabola, we can define the axial vector, how? In this way. So you have here the, uh, the parabola and there is a symmetry axis for the parabola and there is a directrix. So you can consider the unit uh, normal vector which is parallel to this symmetry axis. And we call this the axial vector, okay? And this is just the, and uh, these two form an orthonormal basis. So this is what we call an adapted frame for a non-degenerate parabola. If uh, it is degenerate, it is a line or a half line, uh, the axial vector will be the direction of the line. So in this case, this is what we call the axial vector and this is the adapted frame. And if it is a point, uh, this will be the axial vector and this forms uh, a basis, an orthonormal basis. Okay, so with this adapted frame, what I can do is define the following. Uh, we have the adapted frame, we define the axial normal curvature function as the projection onto this direction, the projection of the second fundamental form onto this direction. But in this case, it does depend on x. Uh, why? Because if I project uh, this line to this direction, okay, the projection of this will be this, but the projection of this is this. So it does depend on, on x, okay? Uh, but um, I can consider, uh, if you take unitary tangent vectors, uh, you can write them in this way. Remember that the unitary tangent vectors were two parallel lines, so y is the height, basically. And uh, then the image of the second fundamental form can be seen as a function on y. And uh, we define the axial curvature as the minimum of uh, these projections, okay? Which is the minimum of this scalar product. So <clears throat> in this picture, we project the, on this direction and the minimum would be this over here. So this will be my axial curvature. And obviously, this is well defined also for um, non-degenerate parabola. You have this. Again, you, when you project to VA, which is parallel to the symmetry axis, this, the, there is a minimum, and that is the axial curvature. Okay. Um, so yes, uh, the axial curvature is the external point of the projection, which can be positive, like here, or if the parabola was back here, it would be negative. Uh, when, it is, when it is a whole line, when the parabola is a whole line, what happens is that, so we have, for example, this is the curvature parabola. The projection here covers the whole, uh, the whole axis. So there is not a, well, there is not a well-defined minimum. Uh, in that case, we, uh, it's not bounded. Okay. And when it is a point, if I project the curvature parabola on this direction, I get the origin, so here the curvature is zero. In fact, these are all the situations where the curvature parabola, uh, where the axial curvature is zero. For example, you have a non-degenerate parabola which uh, passes through the origin precisely at the, this point of minimum uh, of the projection, okay? So here the axial curvature would be zero. Here, again, this half line begins here when you project, the axial curvature is zero. Here, if the half line begins at the origin, also the projection begins at the origin. And here, the point, as I said, uh, is zero. So the axial curvature is zero in these cases. Well, f uh, first of all, um, there's a difference with the umbilic curvature and the difference is that we can find a formula for a general formula when you have, for example, uh, you consider a surface given in Munch form, and the two jets will be given in this way, 
and uh, we, if, uh, with these coefficients, we can calculate the axial curvature, and it's equal to this formula. So it's actually very easy to compute. But, of course, this uh, formula depends on this normal form. And sometimes you have a surface which is not given in much normal form. So what we would like is a formula independent of the coordinates. To start with, uh, we have this lemma, which says that I, I, from now on I'm only considering non-degenerate parabolas or half lines. Because when it is a whole line, it's not bounded. And when it is a point, it's always zero. So I only consider half lines and uh, non-degenerate parabolas. This includes practically all the singularities we know. Uh, well, no, obviously not. But it includes, for example, all the cross cap here, and this includes all the fold singularities, all the frontal singularities, all the, so it's, it's quite wide. Okay, so with these conditions uh, for this coordinate system, which are quite a few conditions, uh, the, form, the formula for the axial curvature is this over here. But using this, we can go to a more general state, uh, statement. And if we only ask a coordinate system such that the partial with respect to u is non-zero and the partial with respect to b is zero, this is, not this is not asking much. This is asking actually very, very little. Okay? For Corank 1, remember, our singularity is Corank 1. So you will, you will always, uh, practically always have a coordinate system like this. So well, uh, with these very few restrictions, uh, the formula for the actual curvature is this monster over here, okay? Okay, so well, it's good, we have this formula. Uh, and something interesting about the axial curvature is that it is an intrinsic invariant. It is an, it, it's defined using the second fundamental form in the curvature parabola, the normal plane, but it is an intrinsic invariant. And it's an intrinsic invariant because we can write it as a combination of the coefficients of the first fundamental form. <clears throat> okay, and uh, why is this curvature interesting? Well, to start with, if we go back to the case of frontal singularities, not only cuspidal edges, any non-degenerate frontal singularity, if nu is the uh, unit normal vector field, then we have the following. The unit normal, oops, the well-defined normal is orthogonal to the axial vector. Okay, so we have the axial vector and this is the unit normal. Uh, the curvature, the axial curvature is zero if and only if, well, this is basically the picture I showed before, the possibilities for the axial curvature to be zero, and this. The absolute value of the axial curvature is the absolute value of the singular curvature, okay? So the singular curvature was defined for first kind frontal singularities. The axial curvature is defined for any Corang one singularity. This means the axial curvature is a generalization of the singular curvature. And why is this interesting? Well, remember, the singular curvature appeared in gauss bonnet appeared in quendrick type formulas, appeared in loads, uh, it gave loads of information about the singular surfaces. So if the axial curvature is a generalization for any Corang one singularity, we can expect it uh, to get this kind of results for any Corang one singularity. So uh, as corollaries of this, we recover and extend many results that were known about the singular curvature. For example, I, I said that the cur singular curvature was an intrinsic invariant, uh, but only they proved it only for cuspidal edges. Well, uh, sin since I've proved that this is uh, intrinsic for any Corang one singularity, this means that the singular curvature is intrinsic for other frontal singularities also. It also says things about the unboundedness. For example, at a swallowtail point, the singular curvature tends to infinity, and this is also captured by this. The swallowtail has this curvature parabola, and the axial curvature is unbounded. So well, uh, it generalizes uh, many results. But uh, besides that, what, what does it, this axial curvature, what can it tell me about the geometry? Well, first of all, uh, if we consider the height function in the direction of the axial vector, then the singularity of the height function is of type A1 plus if and only if the axial curvature is positive. And the singularity is of type A1 minus if and only if the, curv the curvature is negative, and it is more than A2 if and only if it is zero. And in particular, A2 
if uh, there's uh, conditions. Uh, anyways, so when the axial curvature is positive, you have something like this, and the singularity of the height function with respect to the axial vector is a one plus, and here the, it would be a one minus. If you consider the intersection with this plane, okay, you see here it is a point, and here you have two curves, okay? So what does this mean? It means that if the axial curvature is positive, there exists a plane such that the singular surface lies on one side of that plane. And if the axial curvature is negative, there does not, okay? And this, how is this captured in classical differential geometry? Uh, if the point is elliptic or hyperbolic. If the point is elliptic, there is a well-defined plane such that the surface is on one side of the plane. But if it's hyperbolic, there isn't, okay? But uh, what captures this in the singular case is not being elliptic or hyperbolic. It's the axial curvature. Because uh, there is a definition for elliptic, hyperbolic, and parabolic points in singular uh, surfaces. Uh, a point is elliptic if it has zero asymptotic directions, hyperbolic has two, uh, parabolic one, inflection if it has infinite. I haven't defined what an asymptotic direction is. Uh, I don't want to get into details. But the problem is that, for example, this cross cap is an elliptic cross cap, but there does not exist a plane such that it all lies in, the, in one semispace. This is a hyperbolic cross cap, and again, here, both the singularities of the height function are A1 minus. The axial curvature is negative in both cases, but this is elliptic and this is hyperbolic. So we have a problem. Uh, how can I distinguish, if I have negative axial curvature, how can I distinguish if the cross cap is uh, elliptic or hyperbolic? We have this result. If uh, I have a cross cap, which means that the curvature parabola is non-degenerate, and the negative axial curvature, then P is an elliptic cross cap if and only if the intersection of M with the plane orthogonal to the axial vector is two tangent quadratic curves which lie in the same half plane. And it is uh, hyperbolic if they lie in different half planes. Uh, and it is parabolic if one of the curves is a straight line. So the examples I had before, this is the intersection of the surface with this plane for the elliptic cross cap. And this is the intersection for the hyperbolic cross cap. So the, uh, here the two curves are in one semiplane and here they are in different same place. Okay. So the, the, this characterizes that. Uh, this is for, cusp uh, for cross caps. What about, for example, cuspidal edges? If uh, I have a cuspidal edge with negative uh, axial curvature, then it can only be either hyperbolic or an inflection point. How can I distinguish them? We have, again, the point is hyperbolic if and only if the intersection is two tangent cubic curves which meet at two local maxima. Okay, so the local maxima, uh, they, they lie also in one half plane. And it is an inflection if and only if one of the curves has an inflection point at the origin. Okay, so we can also characterize uh, the different types of points for negative axial curvature for cuspidal edges. Uh, for any fold singularity, uh, we, can, we have similar uh, criteria for hyperbolic points, but for inflection points, it depends on the type of singularity, so we decided not to do a general statement. Okay, more things, uh, and to finish. I'm going to talk about the relationship of the axial curvature with the Gaussian curvature of the singular surface. So if you take a, a two jet of this type, the, all this, these are fold singularities and includes all the singularities from Mont's list. And here the curvature parabola is always a semi-line. You can write any singularity of the, with two jet like this, you can write it in this form, okay? With uh, this A2, obviously, V squared, uh, A2 zero is equal to one. Uh, so what we are going to do is we are going to do a kind of blow up to have a well-defined normal at the singular point. And uh, so first, we are going to assume that uh, B1 of zero, which is this over here, is non-zero. 
This includes all BK singularities or S1 singularities. And we have this map over here from R times S1 to R2. And uh, if I take the pullback of this cross product by this map and divide by R squared cosine, uh, cosine of theta, uh, I can define, a well, I have a well-defined normal, okay? So it's a kind of uh, an, uh, blow analytic, uh, analytic blow up to get an analytic uh, normal here at yeah, the singular point. If instead of this condition, you want uh, this condition, uh, then you change the blow up by this, okay, it depends on K. Okay, so you can do this blow up for different singularities. And what happens? That when we consider this blow up, we uh, can con calculate the Gaussian curvature. And the Gaussian curvature in terms of all those coefficients uh, is something like this, which means that for singularities of this type, the boundedness of the Gaussian curvature depends on this term. And this term we have the axial curvature and the umbilic curvature. Okay, so we can relate the Gaussian curvature with the axial curvature and the umbilic curvature. <coughs> but there's also this other term over here, which is problematic in some sense. Because, uh, well, uh, I want to obtain a coending type formula for any Corangwan singularity. Okay, this was done for Caspide Leges by Kentaro Saji. But I want it for other Corangwan singularities. So I consider this vector and uh, I call kappa one the curvature of the projection along this vector, okay? Then this uh, term of the Gaussian curvature is equal to this. We have here the axial curvature. We have this curvature of the apparent contour. So this would be a coendering type formula if this term over here was the curvature, oops, was the curvature of this uh, normal section. But mm, it is not. We have, or we have not been able to obtain this term as a curvature of a normal section, so it is a non coendric time formula. <laughs> but, uh, but there is something interesting about this uh, term. Uh, we could not obtain it as a curvature, of a section, but this term, remember here I'm in general Corang 1 singularities. We have the following. If this term is non-zero, then F is not a frontal. So it is an obstruction. This term is an obstruction to frontality, okay? Uh, for uh, Corang 1 singularities which are not frontals. Okay, so that's what we've done up to now about this axial curvature. Uh, what is left to do? Prove Gauss Bonnet for any Corang 1 singularity using the axial curvature. Remember, for frontals, it was proved using the singular curvature. And the axial curvature is a generalization for any Corang 1 singularity. So we expect to, prove, uh, to be able to prove Gauss Bonnet for any Corang 1 singularity. Gauss Bonnet has been proved for uh, surfaces with cross cap singularities. Actually, that, this was proved by Werner Boy uh, over 100 years ago and reproved uh, five years ago. <laughs> but uh, what about other type of singularities? Uh, my intuition is that the gauss bonnet formula for Corang, isolated Corang-1 singularities will not differ from the classical gauss bonnet formula. So basically, even if in the proof we will need the axial curvature, the axial curvature will not appear in the final formula as the singular curvature appeared in our case. Well, uh, remember the normal curvature squared plus the singular curvature squared was the curvature of the curve squared. What is the meaning of the umbilic curvature squared plus the axial curvature squared for this kind of singularities? I know it is the curvature of a certain curve, but I would like some deeper geometrical meaning. And uh, we've only been talking about Corang one singularities in order to have a, to be able to define a, a first fundamental form. What happens with Corang two singularities? Can we define some curvatures there, some geometric invariants? So this is future work. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks.